We're out here once again, and what we are looking at right here is an element called the confusion matrix. Now, it's going to all come to light in a few seconds. Now, I think the date is March 28th, 1246 a.m. This information or this research or analysis, I should say, I've been waiting for for a long time. What we are going to be looking at is the accuracy of basically something called the antigen test and why this technical term called cumulative density function is so vital, especially to individuals who are being tested weekly. So for example, you see 52 tests there. I'm basically analyzing it after a total of a year. Individuals which are in athletics and so on and so forth, especially in high school sports being tested weekly, uh, this is gonna yield you the chance that you are gonna get a false positive out of 52 tests. But let's get right into the research as follows because it's very enlightening. Now we're looking at basically the Cochrane Review and how they access the accurate rapid test for detecting COVID-19. Now I want this information to sink in real fast. We're about to highlight right here. We would expect the test to return between 125 and 213 positive results. And between 90 and 189 of those positive results would be false positives. So 213 positive results. Of the 213, 189 would be false positives. That is where we're coming into play in reference to what's called the confusion matrix. So let's look at one of these real fast. If you notice, you'll see true negative, false positive, false negative, and true positive. Now you don't have to be a statistics major in order to figure this out in a second. So what we're looking at right now is basically you know, what they call TN, FP, FN, TP. And if you want to look at it in particular, I posted it right here as far as how that works. We're pulling data straight from the research which they presented, which is just immaculate, beautiful research, which will give you a lot of answers to many questions that many of you may have. I'm not going to add any publisher bias to it, even though I am, how would you say myself, confounded. Hopefully not conflated. But you'll see more in a second here. Now, we're not going to look at the accuracy. And the reason we're not going to look at the accuracy is this. We're just going to look at the total, if you add all this up to 100%. It's because accuracy in reference to tests is a very misleading term. So let's say, for example, this is a math test, or I should say, let's say history test, that your teacher is presenting to you. And they're presenting you a 100-question test. And of those 100 question tests, you recognize ahead of time that the teacher made 94 of those questions, the correct answer would be false. So if you were to go to that class, that history class, and take that 100 question test, in order for you to get a 94%, all you'd have to do is answer false to every single question, meaning it throws your accuracy off. Now, if you can detect which questions are true and which ones are false out of the 100, that may yield that, uh, some benefit to being highly accurate. But in reference to how these tests are run, that's going to be questionable at best. So a lot of researchers don't like paying attention to this accuracy number because, hey, if most people are negative and if the test is just running everyone negative, it's going to give you a false sense of accuracy. You see where I'm coming from? All right, now here we go. The confusion matrix. Symptomatic. If an individual had symptoms of COVID-19, it would yield you a true negative 94.1% of the time, a false negative out of, let's say, 10,000 tests. 60 of those would be a false negative, meaning they would get by showing they actually had COVID, but uh, it tested them as negative. 440 that they're truly positive, it would say it has positive, and 90, for example, would be a false positive. Now, we're going to go to the research or the information itself because it will be very enlightening from this point on. So let's get right into the research and you'll see exactly what I mean. So we're going to go actually to the full study itself. And the full study itself is right there. Perfect. All the links for you, the whole lineup. Now, here we go. Are you ready? This is going to bring a lot of it to light. The accuracy of the test. Using summary results, blah, 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 blah. And they used 1,000 people. I moved it to 10,000. There's different reasons for that. I just wanted to make sure we're comparing apples to apples between looking at symptomatic and asymptomatic. 
with symptoms or without symptoms. 53 people would test positive for COVID-19. Of these, nine people would not have COVID-19. That's an FP false positive. That's where it plays into that confusion matrix. 947 of 1,000. Uh, if you notice what we did here, we just, again, multiply, you know, based it upon 10,000. So we're using the same numbers, just basically expanded to 10,000 opposed to uh, 1,000. All right. So 947 people would test negative for COVID-19. Of these six people, 0.6 would actually have COVID-19 false negative results. In people with no symptoms, this is where we end up looking at this particular confusion matrix. And look at the false positives here and the true positives. Now, before we read forward, what this means out of 125 positives, 90 plus 35, out of 125 positives tested on the antigen test for individuals displaying no symptoms, 90 of the 125 would be false positives. That's where we come down to this cumulative density function. But before we conclude with that story, let us read their data as follows. And again, wonderful collection of data. And I'm going to show you that in a second. It goes, in people with no symptoms of COVID-19, the number of confirmed cases expected to be much lower than in people with symptoms. Using summer results, da 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 in a population of 10,000 people with no symptoms, where 50.5 of them really had COVID-19. Here we go. 125 people would test positive for COVID-19. Of these, 90 people, 72% would not have COVID-19, a false positive result. Now, this is when all the alarm bells are going to go off in your head in frequent testing and so forth and so forth because you're going, wow, of the 125 people test positive, and 72% of those people, or 90 of the 125, actually do not have COVID, you can see how this can make a tremendous difficulty in estimating the proper pandemic policy strategy or methods, per se. Let's read forward, though. 9,875 people would test negative. Again, of these, 15.2 would actually have COVID-19 a false negative result. So what you're doing here is you're having a you're doing great at testing people who are negative, but you're yielding a tremendous amount of high false positives. Now, I want to look a little in depth into the research that these individuals did. And if you look at right here, here's your true positive, false positive, false negatives, true negatives. They looked at, I would say, as we go back this way, they looked at the intricacy of all the tests that they basically did was just amazing and i really really encourage you to go through uh the research because they covered a lot a lot of different test strategy uh strategies and this type of work that they did was just incredibly beneficial but the information's out there now it's up for the policy makers or people that have basically influence policy to start looking at it now here you go people go oh it's an antigen chest and they come up with a false positive are right, you ready for this this is the FDA's uh, take on the antigen test. Here we go. And remember, right, I'm not misleading you, USF, you know, Food and Drug Administration, testing basics. This is what they said. Antigen test, right there we go. Do, 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 do. Positive, positive results are usually highly accurate, but false positives can happen, especially in areas where very few people have the virus. Negative results may be confirmed with a molecular test. So all right, here you have it. You have your antigen test. And sometimes a second antibody test is needed for accurate results. Now you get to confounding. Now you begin to look at a lot of the data in reference to basically testing itself. Now, why is that important? Let's look this way. If the antigen test is the primary test, and we've been doing this for quite some time, and they are doing, for example, looking at our world and data, and we're going to use a log form, about a million tests a day. And what is our false positive rate, basically? Let's look at it this way. And false positive rate, right off the bat, it's really weird. Check this out. The no symptom false positive rate, 
outside of being horrendously accurate in reference to uh, basically determining who has a positive or not, reference to the no symptoms or asymptomatic cases, works out statistically to be about the same. So let's just say 1% for basic, for basic ease of the mathematics. So here we go. You have about a million tests a day, 1%. Now I know how many people are going to say 1,000. No, it's 10,000. So 10,000 is about 1% of the test out of a million. So basically, statistically, you're looking close to about 9,000. I know I said rounding. I'm not rounding anymore. I'm using the 0.9 now. So you say about 9,000 false positives a day. Now, the problem, well, let's, 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 go for, let's go forward though. How many people are actually testing positive uh, for COVID-19? All right, so you have a million tests. You're looking anywhere from about 50,000 to about 80,000 right now. Cool. So you could figure if, if 10,000 or 9,000 of those tests are actually not, uh, or they're false positive, you could see how that can mess with your figures. All right, great. But how we're over here we go. The problem is not necessarily with the initial test. And this is where the cumulative density function comes into play. Now let's go back here. And for those not familiar, this just basically means as we do tests, what is the chance out of doing 52 tests, an individual which never contracted COVID will actually end up testing false positive. There you are. Now looking at the math here, we are using a geometric distribution and a cumulus, uh, this is for the statisticians out there on a CDF and basically our chance, I'm just running through a for loop here each time and a 0 0.009 as far as your probability. So basically that's where we're going at a 0.9, remember times 100, don't make a mistake, I made initially and go 0 0.09, uh, but otherwise outside of that, 52 tests will yield you about a 37.5%. So if you follow this down the line, let's say someone's just maniacal with the testing, you know, at 100 tests, you know, you're going to be pretty close to about running about a 58, 59% chance of running a false positive. So the problem is not that you're testing a person once. The problem is you're testing a person multiple times. And if you keep on testing the individual, the odds are eventually you're going to run into a false positive. You see where we're going with that? So that's the aspect. So here you are. Here's basically our confusion matrix, matrixes for an individual with no symptoms and for an individual with symptoms. An individual with no symptoms, going back to the lineup we had right here. Doo -doo -doo. What did they say? We would expect a test return between 125 and 213 positive results. And between 90 and 189 of those positive results would be false positives. There we are, right there. I'm not going to add any bias to that. I'm going to try to even refrain from using an inflection in my voice. But we didn't use Poisson distribution. We did not use normal distribution. We used geometric distribution. And we end up using it along the cumulative density function. So let's say, for example, you're a high school student and you really want to be a pain in the butt. As you're being tested, you basically could say, hey, how many times would I have to be tested in order for me to run a high probability of having a false positive? And see if they have an answer for you. Again, it's school. And in school, it's a place for learning. And basically outside of school, in the real world, for individuals that get tested frequently, yeah, ask the question. Because eventually, if you get tested as a false positive, workplaces get shut down, the restrictions, isolation, people missed, so on and so forth. So it may be advisable to get a second test and reduce the odds of being confirmed as a false positive. That's my take on it. And as far as the FDA saying that basically that uh, this positive results are usually highly accurate. Uh, this particular page right here to do for consumers may need to be updated in the very least. I don't know. They're all smarter than me anyway. So again, don't have to pay attention to the numbers or the figures. Just believe what they say as opposed to the math.
whatever you take you take on it fine for those that have the information it'll be linked for you so you can validate it on your own just in case the rest of everything we have is pretty much trivia um we're looking at basically for example like this and we're going to go to that too as covid numbers fall uh 17 consecutive days uh places being fully reopened that does not just happen in texas that happens in a um actually majority of the states which basically reduced or uh, just dropped the mask mandate we're going to get into that in a second too next the chance of testing positive after a corona uh, after a coronavirus vaccine now the information is coming out, and unfortunately, the information that's coming out is showing that basically the initial data presented by the manufacturers, now you really can't fault them too much for because obviously there was really not a lot of data to pull from before they actually got their approval. But here's the case. And this is going to add to some confounding too in reference to basically you know how effective the vaccine is. The authors estimate the absolute risk, now talking relative risk, the wording is very important, absolute risk of testing positive with SARS-CoV-2 following vaccination was 1.19% for healthcare workers at this one particular healthcare facility and 0.97% for the other healthcare facility, and which is higher than the risk of Moderna and Pfizer clinical trials. Now, keep in mind, so for example, the thing I, I would like to see here is what's the odds of the healthcare worker actually contracting coronavirus to begin with? Because they're being vaccinated, you see where I'm going with this? And they're testing 1.19% as positive for SARS-CoV-2, provided it's not one of those fancy antigen tests and more of a molecular test or something like that. You could see the data. What is the vaccine actually reducing the risk overall in the general population of basically showing positive for coronavirus. If a person that didn't have coronavirus at all is running the risk of basically showing a 0.9%. You see where I'm coming from? So here you look at it. So here we have a vaccine at 1.19% to 0.97%. So you may not even have vaccine failure. That's the irony. It could just be if they're doing antigen tests and ba ba, and there it is. So you could be totally rock solid immune to it and still what causes these false positives. And so just look at it that way. All right, so let's proceed forward. And da -da -da, this is interesting. I'm a big, big, you know, let's put it this way. I pay a lot of attention to pandemic waste, especially when masks become vectors for disease transmission, so on and so forth. You know the whole gambit. I've done it since the very beginning. And I think we're on a 24th week of video reviews reference to COV-19. But this one's quite interesting. Again, here, let's proceed. If you have a mask, or you have gloves, please do not toss it on the ground. And if they're tossing in trash cans, whoever has the trash cans, for goodness sake, please change those trash cans frequently. Otherwise, they become aerosolized vectors for a disease beyond just out of COVID. But to proceed... This is on reference to COVID waste. They found reports about apes. This is how far it's spreading. Chewing on face masks and a penguin with a face mask in its stomach. Pets too, especially dogs, were found to swallow face masks. Animals become weakened due to becoming entangled or starved due to plastic in their stomach. The diversity of animals influenced by corona waste is considerable. Vertebrates and invertebrates on land and freshwater, seawater are becoming entangled and trapped in corona waste. In the overview article in the Journal of Animal Biology, they also found right, that some animals use the waste as nesting material. Again, I'll link to this article too. It is really intriguing. you got to read it and just to see exactly how prolific the waste is becoming in our environment. It's almost a signature for our planet. Let's put it this way, at least on the ecosystem. For example, coots in Dutch canals use face masks and gloves as nest material. All right, for the uh, biostatisticians um, out there, for the epidemiologists already beginning to notice possible vectors, especially if you're taking SARS-CoV-2 and you're thinking bird flu and other elements like that as far as some sort of basically antigenic shift, I believe, not drift. 
and the packaging material from paper handkerchiefs is found in us too. As such, we've even seen the symptoms of COVID-19 in animal structures. Let that be a boating for a little bit. So basically, yeah, we have COVID stuff all over the place, masks everywhere. None of us have probably been immune to the fact of seeing COVID waste on the sidewalks, mountains, in areas we never anticipate. When you're producing billions and billions of masks and so on and so forth, besides gloves, that's inevitability. And unfortunately, our population as a whole, I don't think has a proper appreciation of how damaging this waste is to the environment, even outside of becoming an additional vector for uh, an ailment which was a high, which is a great unknown. So if not for this pandemic and the future pandemics as they come around, uh, something to keep in mind. Now we go into this one, COVID-19, a retrospective. This just gives you an idea of policy decisions on how poor they are. And this goes into the vaccine. And this is really uh, important light. The conclusion, uh, the concluding discussion question of validity of criteria used in selection of priority groups for vaccination in the U.S., it notes that a uniform program for supporting the immunization of all over age 65. Over the age of 65 is 80% of all COVID-19 deaths. Most lives we spare while simultaneously cutting across all socioeconomic and ethnic groups. Continuing this line of reasoning globally would provide an opportunity for the U.S. to, re to reburnish its humanitarian image through the vaccine diplomacy initiative with the goal to vaccinate the over 65 of every nation. To date, almost 500 million doses of vaccine have been administered. Had... They've been targeted to the over, I mean, let's say, for example, the vaccine works. We're not going to doubt it, whatever it is. Let's just say, let's say it works. And I have my questions into its efficacy as well. But let's just say, just for fantasy, it works 100%. And everything we're told is just the science is settled. Let's just give them the doubt and see what happens. Even though, obviously, I have a lot of doubt. It says, if they would have done it right, and they would have targeted the over 65 global population, some 700 million, we would be on a way to returning to, and this is what I like a lot, old normal, not new normal, old normal. Meaning even though all their effort and most mortality is in those over the age of 65 and so on and so forth, the most vulnerable group, for whatever reason, has not been treated the way they are supposed to be, being the most vulnerable group. Instead, what do we do? And I'm not going to get on my podium per se, and say, hey, you know, we send infected individuals to nursing homes, so on and so forth, isolate them, treat them poorly, cut them off from the rest of the world, and then top it all off, they need the vaccine the most, and yeah, you see where I get the picture. Poor policy decisions across the board. And so the, the author's right. And basically, if basically if the vaccine was working at 100%, then why not target the over 65 global population? Seriously, and I'm not pro-vaccine. I'm pro-safe vaccine, but I'm not pro-vaccine. Uh, but over the outside of that, still, what the heck? It's, that's it's silly. And let's go down the rest of the line here. Ah, this is going to come important and real fast in a little bit. This is the number of people that have received the um, COVID-19 vaccine, and this is important overall uh, as we go down the information here. A reference to basically um, how we've done in the rest of the world as far as vaccine distribution. And it's not that people go, oh, well, the infection rates are lower. No, it's, I mean, seriously, uh, this is from our world and data. Oxford University helps with this uh, site. They do a wonderful job. 14.6 uh, United States U.S. population. The rest of the world really, I mean, even Russia and Brazil, they're not really too motivated, it appears. So, yeah, COVID-19 uh, cases declining, most likely even though there's a correlation at the same time, but a, a relationship outside of that? No, nah, not really. All right, but let's get into the data itself. Now let's go back here. Bum, bum, bum. Confusion matrix, and I hope it wasn't for you, but there's a little cumulative density function. I will leave that up if I can keep me out of the way. Not the best place for me, but it's at 0%. So please, nothing mean. 
And here we are, and all the way are cumulative to density function, do 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 chance of false positives. I'm just leaving that up there for a second. So as you're being tested on a regular basis, you can get a good uh, bearing of where you're going to be before you end up with a false positive, and you know, and then decisions have to be made. So let's go into the do 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 the world and data do, do do right here, and we are towards the top. So let's see how the rest of the world is doing. Let me close this little search window there. And where our data is up to date as of March 26, 2021. And mortality percentage. See, it's be going down. Uh, look at this right here. See the case, cases going up? Now, this is going to be interesting as we can look at the rest of the world. Because they're dropping pretty well in the United States. And the United States does, does not do the best as far as in, having a global perspective of how the rest of the world is doing. And so we do see this going up there. Now, it could be more testing, whatever it is. We saw about uh, how questionable the test can be but still just the same mortality percentage is dropping and that's where we really have to focus on and most of my data I'm really kind of reluctant to present in reference to cases because if there's a lot of false positives and it's waning as far as you know hurting people badly the virus itself and it's really got to go down to hospitalizations and so on and so forth because that was the whole reason we had the pandemic mitigation strategies and restricting inalienable rights and everything else like to begin with was to flatten the curve. Because look at this. Here we go right here. And this new case is smooth per million. Do, do, do. And see here we have Great Britain and the United States looking very positive. I'm trying to mean that in a nice way. And you have Sweden here where the case is going up. And now Sweden's kind of weird. They picked up the masks, they started doing more testing, and guess what? The cases went up. And da, 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 look at that. This is like a 30-day uh, lag. There's that. And there's the United States, cases per million. But again, the cases per million are not going to be as important to how much medical care has to be provided to those individuals, especially if these cases per million are false positives in reference to basically asymptomatic individuals i.e. confusion matrix. And here we go. Do, do, do. There's a drop, I think, after a short period of time since uh, January. And there's a new test per uh, smooth per thousand, new cases, deaths per million. And look at our Asian friends. It's like it's like they've always been on the x-axis since we ever started doing this. This is we're going to March 13th. And so I'm going to move real fast. There's USA lockdown, deaths per million. Doesn't really change much, but my gosh, it when we expanded out, it did change quite a bit. Uh, Great Britain, Sweden, see, even though they have a higher caseload than the United States, as we proceed back to here, their mortality rate is less. See, the mortality rate for Sweden is 1.98, and the mortality rate for the United States is 2.997. Now, would you rather have more cases and less people harmed? or like the common cold, or would you rather have less cases and a higher unfortunate level of, um, you know, of hardship? And let's see if there, and there is that. New deaths for Sweden, new deaths for the United States. This is kind of not fair because of population densities, you know, 29 to 1,265. Uh, here is our Asia. And this is important, again, because you know I'm a big, big fan of controls. And so to determine whether you're doing right or not, sometimes, you know, if you're running a foot race, you're looking over your shoulder from time to time to see if you're outperforming your uh, other competitors, you know, before sometimes you actually cross the finish line. And so because you could learn from your competition or you could learn from your allies. You could learn from your friends. And sometimes they try something new and uh, it works. Like, for example, maybe the dietary function, green tea, lychee, all the things we covered for basically almost since the beginning of this, which have not been incorporated in the United States, vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, you know, so on and so forth. And there it is. There's our Asian friends. And, of course, our Armenia. Uh, is, these are all the people as far as deaths per million. And what are we looking at? We're, here we are, the United States compared to India. The Ganji. I alluded to that last week. In February, they had the big religious festivals, and they thought the world was going to come to the end because everyone was gathering and just focusing on what was most important to them. And they tried to discourage it, 
people getting in water and so on and so forth, all next to each other. And the world in India did not come to an end. Um, and here we are in the United States. May I say dysbiosis. And here we are here. Let's look at this. Asia total mortality. 421,988 poor souls. Uh, lost out of 4,463 million. United States mortality. 548,087 uh, 548, poor souls lost. Out of a population, 329 million. 329 million, 4 billion, 463 million, which means we have one mortality out of every 600 people, where Asia has one mortality out of every 10,576. There's our world, there's our caseload, mortality rate is going to drop. This is where our vaccines came in. So you can see not a lot of the world is vaccinated. So I know they're trying to jump on the bandwagon and, and grab some of the credit for the vac for the virus waning, but no. Uh, here's that. There's that. Here's our basically our peep map, and yeah, uh, it, you can draw a correlation again, but you, it's not going to be weighted very strongly. And there's that. Da 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 da. da. Look at this cross here. Mortality percentage. Thankfully, beginning to look at that mortality percentage. Look how low it is. And this is new cases per million. You see, look at that. Look at that separation. So you have more cases that was displayed. But at this point in time, this is more important to me personally than this. If most of the cases are in the being asymptomatic for whatever reason, this is the most important thing. Our whole objective was to flatten this. And it's happening. But however, though, if they keep on preluding this, you're never going to be a free society, no matter where you're at. Uh, so here we go. Ba bump world vaccine to mortality percentage. There is your mortality. Uh, we already know that's going down. Uh, but yeah, we need to wait this because based on the number of vaccines. But you see still, it's positive any way you look at it. And da, 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 what are we doing there? Russian plot. Did we look at that before? Do, 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 do. Da, da, da. Theoretical quantiles. I bring that up each time. Probably because I like to say it, but it, you see something there. Uh, yeah, residuals. Interesting. Uh, new deaths per, uh, per cases per million. Again, we look at this. This is from, I think, February 11th. Yes, so we're going back and all the way up to today. Uh, still, separation. This is the interesting part, South America. Now, I put Brazil into some of the charts because I want to look at that. And this is new cases, new deaths. And as we're crossing, they're going up. Now, we're going to look at a little bit of data here, which can be a little bit perplexing. But here we go. You ready? Look at this. See? New cases. Look at this. But the mortality rate is so incredibly low. So you're having a, a I mean, viruses, from what I believe I heard, their desire is, ironically, and they're not alive, but there's something going on. So we can't give the traditional uh, classification of life. But normally, they mutate to a point where they're highly transmissible uh, because they want the host to be alive, kind of like a parasite. But however, though, they, they become you know, the, the, the lethality of the virus begins to wane. And so here we have that. And here's our new cases in Africa. Uh, Europe, we have a little bit of a rise there. United States, we're going down. So don't ex so you don't expect maybe there can be new cases rise for whatever reason, testing, whatever so. But as long as people aren't being hurt or they don't even know they have it, then what the heck? There's your South America rise. There's our warning. Ba-boom. There's the world. Ba-boom. Mimics kind of this right there. And let's go down, 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 down. Here we are, new cases overall. All right, we are showing different y axes here. And look at, see, look at Asia. And then North America. Do, 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 do. And see, that's the thing. And from our global aspect, you know, we, we're looking at just us. And mm, you know what I mean? Oceania. Yeah, it looks really intimidating until you look at the y-axis. And then South America. 
and new cases overall when we share the same y-axis. So all of Asia, that of 4,463,000,000 people, keep that in mind, even though it has a positive velocity, and I don't mean that mood-wise, in Europe, same thing, South America, and North America. Again, you get an idea of how North America shapes the uh, agenda of the rest of the world. Uh, so because we've been the most inflicted, uh, without a doubt. Look at the y-axis here, 250,000 at one time. These places have never seen what we've seen here. E even with you adding Europe, remember Italy's in Europe, and so they, they, even though we were reading the news a little while ago about how poor Italy was being ravaged, Still, nothing compared to North America. Here we are, new deaths, Asia, Africa, Europe, flat. Now, this is kind of like choppy. This is still, I mean, but look at the, the y-axis. Uh, 4 billion, 463 million people. Africa, Europe, da-da-da, North America, thank goodness, dropping. Oceania, yeah, it looks, see, it again, the chart. It's, it's scary when you don't have a y-axis. Look at two, zero. Two, zero, 3,500. South America, this is our concern. The mortality rate is just way higher than makes sense. But we're we'll going to look at Brazil in a second. When we look at the shared y-axis, South America. Something with the Western Hemisphere right about now. So let's put it that way. Uh, at least our side, I should say. New case per million, shared y-axis, da 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 All right, and here we are, new deaths per million. And... They would see for actually, I mean, this is per million, keep in mind. And so we're pretty much on the low side. And here, me just messing around with ISO codes because I heard like Europe was going to the second phase of lockdowns and so on and so forth. I mean, seriously, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of correlating data. Someone can really stretch and weed through there and use a lot of selection bias and get the data to support pandemic mitigation strategies uh, that are kind of draconian, but no. Let's go to the rest. Investigation correlation, do 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 do. Turn it up. There's a heat map, and probably not the best heat map, but yeah, probably not the best heat map at all. Looking at a computer screen, here's our stringency index. Stringency index, which means the tighter your restrictions, uh, the less uh, disease you're supposed to have. And I, I know people are going to say, oh, well, we don't have the flu as much, and so on and so forth. Well, there's a word for that. And I really recommend you research the term, I should say, viral pathogen replacement. Yeah, you could say the mask is protecting from the flu, but anything that's below five microns with a regular cloth mask, we already know the gamut. If below five microns, good luck. All right, so here we are. And Trinity Index, you see any 0.7s or negative 0.7s? But you see right here, what's this point six? No, it's point oh six three. Sorry, there is a point four three. So on the stringency index, which means the older the population, I guess, the more likely you're going to be stringent. Get off my lawn. There we are. Let's keep on going. Do 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 do. Life expectancy. Remember we tried to do the to find any sort of correlation in the very beginning. Do, 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 do. No, we did not. We just go down, 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 down. This is, remember when we first, first started this too? The mortality rate was at 3.6. Now, I didn't adjust this yet because I, I we're beginning to do, we're actually beginning to catch up to Russia because uh, we're now beginning to do pretty well for the United States as compared to the rest of the world. Uh, Mexico is still pretty hard hit. Uh, France and Peru uh, as far as deaths per million. But you have to keep in mind we're looking at those numbers there. And so the United States is at 2.997, and we started at 3.6. So again, though, about this time, not this time, I should say, back in June, remember you and I were both running, uh, we were running Monte Carlo simulations? And the Monte Carlo simulations showed it should have went way off. There were a few outliers there. Well, unfortunately, none of us planned to follow those outliers. And who knows what happened after that point. I think we started testing younger populations and with asymptomatic false positives that we looked at. Uh, again, I want to reiterate, 
World Mask, totally useless charts because Oxford is not updated. You can't say the United States is a four uh, when basically many of the states itself have been dropping out. You've got to start doing some sort of averaging. And it would be nice if they did because we're definitely not a four. It doesn't change that much. And I'm the one that updated the data. But let's look at the uh, the cases. This is the, the mass thing. This is the deaths. If you could find a correlation or a causative uh, relationship, go for it. Uh, cases per million, da da da. United States, uh, this is tests per thousand cases per million. And uh, nice separation there. About the same as it was right there. Uh, Sweden, they started going to mass level, boom, 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 but now up to two. And before they would say, no, we're not going to do masks, da 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 da. And then all of a sudden the kings started saying, no, you got to do masks. And they started to do masks. And I don't know. You tell me. I mean, may, did it make a difference in deaths or, you know, because they didn't do any mass there and they did a mass here, but I don't know, you know, before they were concerned about ocular absorption or through food and so on and so forth. Cases per million going up, as we said, but however, though, deaths per million going down. So how, if the objective is to flatten the curve and the curve is already flat, again, I'm not a policymaker, so this is for policymakers. Test per thousand, nice separation there. But as you look at this correlation, doo -doo 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 -doo, almost identical. As you're beginning to go up in tests, you're beginning to get more cases. And again, if you do an antigen test like we looked at, that would be fully self-explanatory. Brazil, deaths per million. Again, they're going up. Mass levels, you tell me. Dysbiosis, weakened immune systems, so on and so forth. I don't know. Uh, here we go. Do, do, do. And we're still, I have no clue what that was. That's supposed to be test per thousand. That should have ran ran through, but maybe not keeping track of tests. We'll have to look at the data frame a little bit later on, but this is the cases per million. And then Japan, Asian friends, doo -doo -doo, nice separation, nothing. New Zealand, now Oceania. And look at this. It's like they're right along the x-axis. Da -da -da, da -da -da. Finland. Finland was worrisome a little bit. Yeah, they went to a one on the mass level, which means it was kind of recommended in certain areas. And the test, but they, there was no, like, no panic. And, you know, that's the deaths per million. You know, your cases are up there. But your deaths, no. Which really what matters, again, to reiterate. India, big religious festivals, tons of gatherings, da-da-da. Um, look at them. If that's the numbers... Mass level four, and the weird part about it is they have the mass level four, but they admit they go, yeah, good luck enforcing that, and so it's more like a recommendation required, yes, followed, hmm, it's kind of like driving laws, and so here India, nice separation, and they they seem to be doing pretty well, uh, Spain, bouncing back and forth up there, uh, they never did a data correction, which kind of disturbs me. Uh, because, yeah, they never did a data correction. But look at that. This kind of mirrors itself, which I always find kind of unusual. France, they want to go through lockdowns again. Everyone evacuating Paris. Da -da -da. Macron wants to be the head of the EU. He wants to take Angela Merkel's position. So he's under pressure to act accordingly. Do -do -do, France, da -da -da, case of million. Uh, wow, look, see the dance there? Again, unusual. Correlation is not causation, but still just the same. United Kingdom, they had it. And they were going through tons of restrictions. They were pushing back pretty hard. And what happened amazingly? Is that a correlation? Or do people just say, hey, stop it? And look, this here, look at the cases per million and the deaths per million. It's like, you know, I obviously you can see right there, it's not the same chart. But wow. And look at the tests per thousand to the cases per million. That's the biggest separation I've seen as far as any of the charts are concerned. Italy, um, you know, there it is. Cases per million, you can go by that. Italy I always worry about a little bit. And then we go to the data here and pass on this one, pass on this one. Hospital occupancy, I think we're going to pass on because, yeah, we have it updated up to the 27th. Uh, nothing really exciting. Alaska, I had in the beginning because of data irregularities. California, inpatient beds used by COVID patients. Inpatient beds used. 
available. It's right there. New York going down. Florida pretty much down. Or I know mass states. Sure, because remember the world was supposed to end. Again, I know they mean well, some of these epidemiologists, but how are those still just the same with the CDC and so forth? you got to have controls. If you're not paying attention to your data, you know, you're weaponizing uncertainty. And you can't have this Munchausen disorder forcing the population to feel like they're suffering from sort of a Stockholm syndrome. Right now, people just want to get the vaccine. They don't even care if the vaccine works or not. All you hear them talking about is get vaccinated so we can open up, the, you know, open up society. You know, that's, that's, that's Stockholm syndrome. That's silly. Iowa, no mass. There's that. Uh, North Dakota, no masks. Montana, no masks. Just looking at the, the data with the, the hat there. And then uh, Mississippi, uh, Texas, da, da, da. let's go to, I'm going to pass on the vaccine part real fast because the allocation numbers, there. I mean, they, right now, if the population was fully vaccinated, it should be, you know, way up there, that 27% across the line, except for New York, which always lags. I don't know why. Maybe one of the um, individuals from the health department could chime in. I'd really appreciate that. Uh, then how about 27%, 29%, 26%? Pretty uniform distribution or even distribution. Uh, there's the bed data. That's what you see. I'm not paying attention to it. Last update was on the 4th. Remember COVID tracking went down. Healthdata.gov. Uh, went down on a few of the sites too. The last reports was, I think, on. Do I have it up here still? Uh, no, I don't. But I think the last report was on on the third of fourth um, of March. And but if we look at the data, we, we do have available here. If vaccine delivery was perfect, percentage-wise, that's how many people in each population in that state would be vaccinated. Right to there. Do, do, do. And now we're going to go to our, no, not the confusion matrix, COVID rebuild. All right. And this is going to give us the most, uh, we're going straight from the CDC on our data on here and not going to John Hopkins or anybody else like that or Oxford University. We're just going straight to CDC data itself and hospitalized patients with COVID to total inpatients. If people want to see the data frame, we're going to have loose states and tight states, if not familiar. And loose states mean they have no mask mandate as a general rule. And there is our data information for those that want to see that. Boom, right there and there and there. And here we go. And again, data frames may be a little bit shortened voluntarily because the vaccine information tends to go up to past up to um, beyond March 27th. I was looking at this going, oh, no, data. March 31st, 2020, something's wrong. But no, it's the it's data frames. Uh, it's just where it is in the position of the index. And so on and so forth, da, da, da. there we are, March 29th, 2021. And there we get our data right. There's all of our columns, boom, 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 boom. Types of data, da, 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 categorical data, da, da, do. And here we go. And you can see right here, it's pretty much, eh. So I'm going to scan through that pretty fast. There's Florida. I'm making headlines, we just showed. It's, eh. And so hospitals do not look like they're being overrun. Uh, and in any particular uh, portion, remember the purple line, for those not familiar, is basically the hospitalized patients with COVID to total inpatient beds. And there's that. Not the inpatient bed used, total available inpatient beds. And I'm moving kind of fast, I know, I apologize, but still, let's get down to the information. New deaths per 100,000, no mask, loose restriction states. And we'll shorten up this data and the date in a little bit, but you see right there. It doesn't make a difference where you go in. There may be a little bit of rise there in Montana. Da -da, new deaths per 100,000, tight restriction states. I'm going to go to the shortened data. It's more vital. Let's just scroll down. Arkansas is going to drop off the mass, I think, believe in April 1st, so we'll consider that a loose, a loose state. Uh, new deaths per 100,000. This is, again, loose states. Compared to tight states, heavy restrictions compared to loose restrictions. And right there, you see the um, yellow is basically your loose. And so, yeah, loose restriction states. What do we say here? Nursing homes, probably. But loose restriction states tend to do farther better uh, as far as deaths per 100,000 as opposed to tight restriction states. And uh, mortality. 
Yeah, it looks scary. Let's look at that. That's new cases. Those are tight restriction states. This right here is our box and whisker chart. Is really, you know, look at all the outliers. You know, but how are those? This is the, the numbers coming in. So you see all these outliers are right here. This is not going to really give you too much information. And the fact that, that they tend to, at one time or another, group it, group data. In this case, is cases. In this case, cases. And just throw a report at all at once. So it's more of a warning sign to me. Uh, this is the average, for example. And this is uh, TGT, which means, for me personally, tight restriction states. Uh, this is the average cases per 100,000. You can look at the code there. Uh, it smoothed. Rolling seven, I should say. New cases per 100,000 smooth and loose restriction states. So again, you're trying to find a correlation, not trying to pit states against each other. But when you have controls available, and there's no difference between the control and what the, you have the pandemic mitigation states, then why make people's lives miserable? Uh, there you are, cases per 100,000. Right there, probably a little higher. Uh, but again, we're not looking at cases, we're looking at hospitalizations and mortality. Green states for the white states, da, 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 right there. Uh, white is your tight restriction states, but recently, look what's happened. As we tightened that a little bit, uh, looking at new cases per 100,000 are now actually higher, substantially higher if we break our dates down to the beginning of March than under loose restriction states. Think about that. Uh, now we break those dates down, the, the dynamic changes. And so here we are at 114 cases per 100,000 on tight restriction states compared to 109 per 100,000 on loose restriction states. Again, controls. The damage that's done between schools being closed and so on and so forth, I don't have to say. You know the collateral damage is insane. And if you're not winning on those tight restrictions, then why? That's just bad leadership, really bad leadership. Uh, and here we are, and we go down here, new cases, do, 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 let's just pass by that. Uh, deaths per 100,000, smooth. The uh, green is the loose states here, let's see. White's the tight states, da, da, da. white's the tight states. And here we are, we're right about the same, let's make it a little bigger, there's a reporting data, da da da, report, da do. Uh, yeah, new deaths per 100,000. So uh, here you have the white states, the, the tight states, which is the white bar, is a little bit better uh, in deaths per 100,000 than the green. But again, there's a lot of collateral damage done by there between shutdown of health services, so on and so forth, isolation situations. You don't have to be a genius in order to figure out why this gain between tight restrictions and loose restrictions is offset massively by other social service uh, disruptions at cancer testing, disease testing, elective surgeries, so on and so forth, I mean, non-elective surgeries. A new case is smooth, da 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 Here we are, deaths per million, deaths per million, deaths per 100,000, uh, per 100,000 rolling seven. Right there, we looked at that already. New cases, new cases per 100,000, tight restriction states. A uh, little bit of a rise, ironically. It's not dropping as fast in the tight. Look at Vermont. It's like not even dropping. And you're having a little bit of a rise in the tight restriction states, which, again, is just correlation, not saying causative. Uh, you know, and then the loose restriction states. Again, I'm just looking at visual data which is not the best way to do it. Here's our new case of 100,000. No mask or loose restriction states as of January, 2021. And I got problems, you know, for example, with testing centers and things like that because I think they become huge vectors. And especially to people that wear masks in their cars, uh, if you're dealing with an aerosolized virus per se that's below five microns, we've already covered this before, and your mask slows the breathing rate down, especially in a... Uh, virus that tends to, uh, how would you say, thrive off a nasal deposition, not good. So I'm waiting for the government to say, hey, stop wearing the masks in the cars. Uh, then why? To what end? It's like, besides, even if it wasn't even the virus, fungal infections, breathing difficulties, dysbiosis, so on and so forth, why? All right, and here is that. 
and there is our cases. Nice drop, a little bit of a uh, fall off on Alaska. These are the no mask loose restriction states. And then our basic air tight restriction states. Boom, 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 boom. It's a lot of rises on those tight restriction states. Again, correlation is not causative. All right, so real fast, let's wrap this up. We covered. Doo, 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 doo. Basically, we have here is our our false positive rates. And I want to emphasize 125 people with test positive for COVID-19. Of these 90 people, 72% would not have COVID-19. 72% would not have COVID-19 even though they tested positive in asymptomatic individuals. And even though the FDA thinks, oh, this is great. I think the FDA needs to review its position because no, it's not great. These researchers did an incredible, incredible job, and the link will be there for you to follow. Uh, ba ba ba. Uh, we already know about that. The uh, lowest restriction states are doing better, so whatever. And then the vaccine. I have still a, a pretty good chance of testing positive, even after being fully vaccinated. Uh, the animal life is being tremendously messed up in many more ways than one. Uh, when you have apes chewing on face masks, mm, you know, you're creating a ton of new vectors. And then, but bump, uh, vaccine distribution uh, didn't seem to be the highest priority in getting to the most vulnerable groups globally. And really weird after all this talk and everything else like that. And no, it didn't happen. But again, Ralph signing off once again, gratitude thank you i will leave this up as we conclude because this way you can look at the basically cumulative density function and this will give you at least a little bit of an idea of where to go if you get tested so many times what's your opportunity to run into a false positive based upon the antigen tests as we currently have and if you do test positive it probably on certain type of these antigen tests it may be a wise idea to get a second test just to validate. And again, that's best case scenario they did when they did the true positive, false, negative, da 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 da, at seven days after basically supposedly um, infection or symptoms began to arise. Again, we're after channel signing off. Thank you. Gratitude. Look forward to seeing you all once again either Tuesday or late, or I should say early Sunday morning. Catch you all in a bit. Bye.